Philippians chapter 1. Follow with me as I read 21 through 26. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and your joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample calls to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Now, we've, we've had a, a, a decent three-month journey in Philippians thus far. Believe it or not, 90 days of Sundays we've been in Philippians. And we've seen Paul's argument developing. We've seen Paul's expressions. We've seen Paul's testimony. We've seen Paul's prayers. We've seen Paul's zeal. We've seen Paul's suffering. And all the while, he has an opportunity to do something that very few of us ever do. And that is, he has an opportunity in this moment in time where he is a coin toss away from either living or dying. I say a coin toss, it's not about chance, but it's one or the other. There are no other options for Paul. Paul will either be spared when he stands before the emperor or he will be beheaded or crucified. And Paul in his heart is saying to us, but specifically to these Philippian Christians, you know my love that I have for you. You know my prayer for you. You know our partnership and our suffering and in the grace of God. You know all that has been happening. And, and friends, here is what I want you to know. I want you to know that what has happened to me is for the sake of the advancement of the gospel. So, in that, the things that are happening are God's doing. And my suffering is, is, is causing a stir in the hearts of the brothers here. And the gospel is being proclaimed. Even those who hate me and wish to do me harm, God is using them to preach a gospel that is true. And then he says, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And we looked at that over the last few weeks and we've, we've understood what Paul was trying to say. That his present circumstances, his current life was Christ. It, that when people looked at his life, they did not see Paul's plans. They did not see Paul's suffering. They did not see Paul's uh, issues or, or, or Paul's ministry, but they saw Christ at work. Paul looks at other places in Scripture, as we see if we look there, we would see Paul's theology about being in Christ and how life is Christ. We even looked over at chapter 3 a little bit last week at, at how that life living in Christ would, would look just as an individual, as Paul then would tell the Philippian church that they must live in the same manner. And when we get to this place, we see and to die is gain. A lot of times we do what is natural. With a proper theology, we realize, as Paul says, that dying is gaining because I get to be with Christ. He even argues that. But what's happened here, the, mean, the, the, the main point of this little section of text is, or the main thing that we should be considering when reading this, is this point. In verse 25, he says, convinced of this. Convinced of this. And so, if you think about that for a moment, and then you see what he says in verse 22, yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. And then he says in verse 23, I am hard pressed between the two. What of the two? Living or dying? Living is Christ, dying is far better. I am hard pressed between the two. I do not know which I should choose or what I will choose. Then verse 25, I am convinced of this. So, see, what we're seeing here is not this, not this teaching moment for Paul, though it is a teaching moment. What Paul is doing is he's helping his readers follow his process of thinking. Paul is helping his readers see that Paul came to a crisis of choice. 
Paul came to a crisis of heart. And when I say crisis, I'm not talking about unbelief, but wow, how many good choices do I have before me? What shall I choose? I can only have one meat and three sides, and there's 25 meats that I love to eat. Have you ever been there? You ever been to the... It's, you know where you find that at the food court in the mall? Where they give you all these samples of free food, and then you, got, you want this? Well, for, for $4, you get the one meat and the one side, but you want three meats. Well, that's 15 And then you get it, and you can't eat it all anyway. What a weak little example. But in some sense, the greatest desire of Paul's heart was laid before him twice. Two choices. What shall he choose? And you might say, well, I don't, I don't see. He says to die is far better, but to live is Christ. If Christ is the truest desire of Paul, if Christ is the fullest of Paul's satisfaction, if the grace of Jesus Christ is that which Paul desires above all things to be the absolute uh, adhesive that fills him and, and, and carries him and holds him and keeps him together, then he is saying that both of these choices are indefinitely glorious. And he does not know what he shall choose. And so he carries his readers through this sim, somewhat uh, frustrating place and says, I want this and I want this. This is better for me, this is better for you, but yet this is Christ and this is Christ and what shall I do? Then he comes back to the end of verse 25 and he says, but convinced of this. And so we are seeing Paul, I'm sure he didn't figure this out as he wrote it, but he wrote it so that we could see that Paul struggled with this. Paul struggled, what good thing shall I choose? What good thing shall I choose? desire. Now some people would say, well it's an obvious choice. Paul wanted to die. Of course that's great for Paul as he says. But then dying would not be good for us. But Paul disagrees with that as, was, as we've seen and as we'll be reminded today. Had Paul lost his life, it still would have been good for the Philippian church because Paul understood that being in Christ when we share in the suffering of Christ that it fills up what is lacking in Christ, according to Colossians. It's right into the Colossian church. And that while Paul was in prison, it gave boldness to the Christians. When Paul was arrested, his suffering gave courage to the church. When Paul was arrested, what we, what we would think was that, wow, the planting of churches would die down, they actually exploded. So. What would happen if Paul were to die? What would happen if Paul were to die? I want you to just think about that because that's really where Paul is writing. He is really showing these Philippian Christians that he had a choice. Now, was it Paul's choice? No. Paul knew that it was Christ who would work this out for his good. Christ's own glory. That it was God the Father who had him securely in whatever outcome would be. But here is where I think we need to understand when he says, which shall I choose? How would Paul choose which destiny would be his door to open? Well, friends, just like we have decisions come across our minds and hearts every moment, how do we handle the decisiveness of that? The wisdom of knowing which one... We might say, well, Paul, Paul didn't have a choice. He didn't have a choice because as he prayed, he needed to pray effectively toward either one or the other. Oh God, kill me that I might be with Christ. Let my death be a witness to your power. That would be a prayer that I would pray. That would be a prayer that Paul desired to pray above all things. But then Paul then considered, but if I stay, the benefit to the church would be even greater at this place. So I believe Paul's frustration, if you will, and I use that word very lightly because I think frustration is sin, but his, his dichotomy, his choices were more in line with how he should pray the Lord work rather than worrying about which one he would choose. Because did, did Paul change what he was going to say to the emperor? Did Paul change the gospel? Did Paul recreate his ministry plan? No, he stayed the course. So let's look at this stuff piece by piece. Just have this in your mind as we go through this today. Christ is life. To live is 
Christ. I don't want to preach all the way through that last week, but I want you to remember that Paul is saying here that his life is Christ. His life is Christ-like. His life is for Christ. His life is an image of Christ that when people see Him, they see Christ. Everything that He does. Be encouraged by that. We left our time together last week with that understanding that we as His people are to press into that desire. We are to desire that everything we do in our lives is not just for Christ and His glory, but the way that it's for Christ and His glory is that it, it exemplifies Christ, that it reflects Christ, that if we are doing this project or talking to this person or issuing a, 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 an opinion on this subject, that it should be that the same as if Christ were engaged in that business. Christ were engaged in that activity. Christ were engaged in that conversation. That's why things like gossip are, is considered murder according to the apostles. That's why the, the, the sins of relationships between brethren and sisters in the church are paramount. Where John would say that if you don't have love, that you're a liar. No matter how sound your doctrine is. No matter how godly your theology might be, when your heart and your life does not reflect that, something is amiss. But then he, when he says, and to die is gain, at the base of all of that, Paul is saying and proclaiming that the reward of death is life. That the reward of dying in the flesh, and when he says in the flesh, he's not talking about the sinfulness of the flesh. He's talking about the physical body, the flesh, that to die is to receive the reward of Christ. That Christ is the crown. Christ is the joy. Christ is the hope. Christ is the treasure of heaven. As Jesus would argue in the, in the gospel accounts where he says that the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field and the worker in the field discovers the treasure and covers it and then with joy, he goes and he sells all that he has that he may buy the field. The pearl of great price. The same thing. And then Jesus, in speaking to Nicodemus, tells him that he cannot even see the kingdom, much less enter it, except to be born of God. Paul had been born of God through a massively supernatural, sublime, and divine interaction with Jesus on the road to Damascus. Paul, in his zeal to persecute the church became the voice of the gospel. He became the voice of God to us, the Gentiles of this world, that we might see the beauty of God in the face of Christ and thus have absolute joy and absolute glory and that we share in all things in Christ. Paul said to die is to receive all of that that I have been working for. Paul tells young Timothy, I have run the race, I have won the prize, I have finished the race. I'm being poured out. I'm finished. Praise God. Praise God. But see, I don't think Paul is much like me in that when I think of that, I am absolutely selfish. I'm not, t I'm not saying that, and it's not selfish to have Christ as a prize, but I'll tell you, when I just say those things and I think, oh my goodness, the day that I don't have to struggle and fight and bear this world, what a glorious day it shall be. Yeah. What is that old you know, hillbilly sounding song? You know, I can't remember, but a bunch of them are ringing in my ears. And there's no reason people get excited. I mean, there's, there's, it, it explains why people get excited about all those things. Thinking about the day of the Lord, the time when we, even in death, are going to be separated from this God-forsaken, if we can, planet. But it's not God for sake. And Paul knows that it's not. Christ is amongst the world. Christ is with His people. Christ's people are together. Christ is there. Christ is here. Christ is with us. And yes, we yearn and we long to be with Him. And it is not sinful to long to be with Christ. It is not selfish. But in a fleshly way, I would say that if I were about to have my head chopped off, I might swing that sword, baby. But by God's grace, Paul was able to consider the calling 
of his life. That there was something more than just his own personal salvation that was more important at this moment in history. And that was not just the salvation of more and more people as grace abounds more and more, but the growth of those people to come to a place where they would rest where Paul is resting at this very moment in time. Christ is the reward when this life is done. And Paul knew that living in this life was Christ visible. And Paul knew that living in this life was Christ's, was a reward from Christ, but then that Christ himself would be the reward when this life was done. And then he says these words. Verse 22, If I am to live in the flesh. You notice, for to me, if I am, which I shall choose. I am hard-pressed. My desire. I know. This is Paul sharing his heart with, this, with these people. This is Paul expressly showing and revealing as he's worked these things out the power of the gospel of grace. And here Paul then says, If, if, I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Now let's think about that for a second. Because to me, if, if when I hear Paul say, and to die is gain, or to die is far better than living, then how is it that he then comes back and somewhat, not contradicts, but waters down that in my, in my mind, where he says that if I live, it's fruitful labor for me. It's fruitfulness for me. If dying is the best option in the world, if it is my highest desire, if it is my, if it is my grand magnum opus of ministry is to die for the sake of the gospel, then how is it thou that living is fruitful? Well, think about it. Paul says, if I live in this flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet, which I shall choose, I cannot tell. So what is fruitful labor for Paul? Think about it for a minute. How, how would we answer that in our own lives if we were to say, I, I'm ready to leave this world. I'm ready to see my Lord. I don't know that there'd be anyone under the sound of my voice that would not say amen. But then when God says, this is not your day, you remain. How do we, how do we not get dis, just become despaired or downtrodden because Paul, as Paul understood that fruitful labor is Christ we in the same way should understand that that is, the same, that that is true so what is fruitful labor for Paul well let's think about what we've already learned just in this context suffering for the sake of the gospel Paul says that his suffering is fruitful work for him it's good for him it's fruitful for him, that it's productive, that it's actually producing something that he desires to see produced. So suffering is fruitful labor for Paul if he lives and remains in prison. S proclaiming the gospel is fruitful labor for Paul. Sometimes we think of ourselves called of God, and I know this is a very, very frustrating thing for a lot of men especially who just get caught by the bug of ministry well I just want to give my life to the work of God and I got to go into the ministry you know we've got to be vocational pastors or we've got to be full time in ministry I've never heard of part time ministry I've never seen part time ministry I've never understood what that means now I've heard of full time program directors and I've heard of full time activities coordinators and I've heard of full time CEOs and office managers who carry the title as pastors, but when it comes to ministry, all of us, no matter who we are or what we're called to specifically, we are not part-time ministers. We are full-time ministers. And it often frustrates me because I've been there when I see a man who, who feels called to the pastorate and yet his whole life is spent trying to get away from the job that he's in rather than being obedient to the call that he's given. If I could just get rid of this job then I could be in the ministry. How about that job be the first place you minister? How about your house? 
How about your neighborhood? What stops a man from hunting? What stops a man from fishing? What stops a man from riding crazy four-wheelers and putting his life in danger? Nothing. Nothing. What stops a man from his hobbies? What stops him from doing those weird death-defying acts that he likes to do? Nothing. Nothing. But yet, it seems like life and every little minute detail stops many people from answering the call to live for Christ. Paul, no matter if he was in jail or making tents or picking up peanuts, he said it was Christ. And it was opportunity to proclaim the gospel. And it was fruitful labor. Fruitful labor for Paul not only was suffering and proclaiming the gospel, but living in the gospel living in the gospel. In other words, as he began to have these pains in life, these persecutions, these sufferings, these somewhat obvious setbacks, Paul said, this is the gospel. The good news of Christ is living in me, therefore there is none of this that takes my joy away. Living in the gospel is this place that I stand and rest with the sufficiency of God's grace, which is enough for even my physical ailments as he prayed three times for God to take away the thorn in his flesh. And Jesus says, my grace is sufficient. Living in the gospel is fruitful labor, even if you're on a bed dying. Living. Preparing others with the gospel is fruitful labor for Paul. Paul prays for these people. He prays that God would fill them with all the fruit of righteousness. He prays that God would uh, expand their love and grow their love and give them discernment and knowledge that, may, that they may approve what is excellent. He, he wants them to continue to partner in the ministry. He wants them to understand that they too will suffer in the ministry. And so Paul's fruitfulness, even in prison, look at what he wrote while he was incarcerated. Look at when God took him off the streets and off of the public ministry, what Paul did by the grace and divine providence of God to give Christ to us. And so Paul says, if I live, it is fruitful labor for me. And fruitful labor for me, that which is good, that which is successful, that which is is holy, that which is satisfying, is preparing you, O Philippians, for the gospel, with the gospel. Paul knows that fruitful labor for him was also full of joy. There was never a time that I think as Paul, though he grimaced under the pain of beatings and stonings and shipwreckings and incarcerations and accusations, as Paul grew in joy, I believe he began to smile <laughs> and almost laugh as they chained his arms around a pole to take the flesh from his back. What joyful laughter must have been in his heart as he thought this is exactly what my God and my Lord has ordained for me. What fruitfulness my life has right now. fruitful labor is knowing that the gospel is Jesus. Is knowing that living in the flesh is Christ. That living is joy. And that living is fruitful. No matter where we are, as we are in Christ, living is fruitful. Friends, this is why I continually focus and harp Pound, and I'm, I'm really light on the issue. I mention it passive aggressively. But that's why I continue to focus on the issue of being the body of Christ. Who is your church? Who is your family? The church has a face, not a place. And so you've got to realize that the way we grow into this is that we together grow into this. 
you've always heard the bumper sticker lingo. You know what a bumper sticker lingo is? The cute little saying that everybody quotes and nobody knows what it means. And you see it on a bumper sticker, and I've seen this years and years and years, not recently, but I've seen it a lot. People don't do bumper stickers anymore because they put them on Facebook. But you understand the idea of a chain, no matter how hard and bold and strong and thick it is, it's only as strong as its weakest link. And I've heard people use that as a metaphor for the church, that the church is only as strong as its weakest member. That's not true for us. The church is only as strong as its head. Then I've heard the old bumper sticker, the church is only as strong as its weakest member on its knees. But let me give you the reality of it. The only way you will be strong is that we become strong. And when you become strong, we will become strong. And if there's someone who can barely raise their head, then those who are strong will pick them up. When there are those who feel that they've lost their faith, we who are strong will secure them in it. When there are those who run because of sin in their lives, we who are strong will restore them. Except they not be in the faith. And then discipline is, in, is practiced. So that God, through discipline, would draw them back. If, it, if indeed they belong to Him. So, it's fruitful labor for Paul. It's fruitful labor for us. As God's people. No matter what we're experiencing, it is fruitful labor for us. And I believe Paul, when he says it's fruitful labor for me, because he said, for to me to live is Christ, then Paul says it is fruitful labor for Christ. Because Paul's me is not him. Paul's me is Christ. That's what he says. So how is it that then this now has nothing to do with Paul and everything to do with Christ. Because suffering for the gospel is for the sake of Christ. It glorifies Christ in His body. Whether by life or in death. You see what he says just a few words before this. Proclaiming the gospel. Living in the gospel. Preparing others for the gospel. Having joy in the gospel. Living joyfully and fruitfully in the labor. It is fruitful labor for Christ. Christ grows His people. I will build my church, Peter. This knowledge that God has given you is the foundation on which my people will be built. That I am the Son. I am the Lamb. I am the Christ. And I have come to seek and save that which is lost. It is fruitful labor for Christ. And in Christ, as we labor for Him, as we labor in Him, for the sake of each other, Christ is laboring. Because it's His work. It's His power. It's His ability. It's His righteousness. It's His passion. It's His zeal. It's Christ in us. Paul would proclaim that it is not I who live, but Christ who lives within me. That's why sin and failure in our morality or in our obedience, I don't even want to use the word morality, in our worship is such a pock to the church because it depicts wrongly that which we are. It, it puts the wrong image to the world of who our Father is. But as a fruitful labor for Christ, it creates something for the body. And what it does is it creates growth in the body. Fruitful labor for Christ, according to Paul, is that the body would be strong. It would be strengthened. It would become bold. It would become passionate. That those people would be glorious. You notice he says that there. So that with me you may have ample cause to glory. I want to give some time to that phrase next week. To glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. You will grow 
you will love. Your affections will be transformed. If I labor here, then Christ is laboring here, and this is fruitful for me. It is fruitful for the gospel. It is fruitful for you, Paul then argues. You will become preachers of truth. You will grow into a unified people, not looking to secure your own homes, because you joyfully, to still away from Hebrews, accepted the plundering of your property because you knew you had a greater reward, an abiding one. We're not looking to secure our own communities, but rather understand that all communities and, 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 and institutions will pass away, but the kingdom of Christ will endure forever. It doesn't mean we're not good stewards, but it's not our cause. We will see others forgive each other, we will see the church bear one another's burdens, bear each other's weakness, bear each other's sins. In the sense of bear, and then we just like, oh, this brother needs to grow a little bit. And we feed each other, and we defend each other. This is fruitful labor for Christ. This is fruitful labor. I believe Paul would agree with this statement in that if I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Which is that you would become a people for God's own glory who would rise to the greatness of His work as Christ works in you to reveal His glory and His power. But then Paul here says, Yet I cannot tell what I shall choose. I do not know what I shall choose. Paul is torn, torn between the joy of living fruitfully for the sake of the gospel and going and being with the gospel giver. And the reality is that both give him satisfaction. Both are equally as pleasing to his soul. Both are the cause of Christ is the grand author of his life. He is satisfied in them both. I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. Now, there's something that we should learn there that I didn't think about until this very moment, but it is far better for Paul, and it is far better for the Philippians. And it is far better for us. It is far better for us that we die and be with Christ. For it is the great prize for which we live, for which we strive, for which we war. It is far better. But, verse 24, to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress in joy in the faith so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Hard pressed. I'm hard pressed. This was no easy situation for Paul. Paul wasn't coming here and saying, you know, I've just been thinking about it. Contemplating. Theorizing. Paul was pressed. Like being up against the wall with some really big guy trying to take your wallet and he's pushing you up against that brick. Or having a ton of material fall on you and you're just sort of pressed. He's pressed. He's hard pressed. He is having to really consider, prayerfully consider, what is the best thing for me to, to want, to, to desire. Neither of his choices is sinful. I believe God, I believe as Paul prayed that his love would abound more and more. See, he gives the prescription here for the Philippians. With knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless. Remember, we talked about that's not just salvific, but also presently. And so Paul had said, I love you with the affection of Christ Jesus. I yearn for you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And that as I pray for your love to abound more and more, I believe Paul is able to pray that because he prays that for himself. 
Lord, let, let this affection that I have, that I yearn for these people, what is this affection? It's not just to hang out and fish, y'all. It's not just to hang out and do cool things together because they're incredible people. Matter of fact, I bet you there were some uh, very non-incredible people as part of the church of Philippi who would be aggravating to many of us. Especially those that just don't get it. Would you stop? Would you walk away? Would you grow up? Have you ever felt like that? But Paul says that the prayer that he has is that their love may abound. He prays that for himself. It's a, it's a common assumption that Paul would not pray or command someone else to do something that he would not command of himself in Christ to do. And pray for himself that God would do in him as he wants God to work in everyone else. And so here now Paul is practicing what he prays and preaches. Paul is able to go, I'm hard pressed. I'm being honest with you people. I don't know what I should do. Because both of them are incredibly satisfying. But I know that I want to be with Christ a lot more than I want to live in this world. It is my end game, if you will, Paul would say. It is far better. But I'm hard pressed. I don't, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. And so in this, that means he's overwhelmed by the choice. But now here's something that you need to understand because of what Paul has already told us. Paul then is, is by the Spirit of God being worked to know what is wise and excellent. That he can approve that path and that prayer that is most certainly the will of God at this moment. And as Paul prays, the Spirit of God gives him an affection that is absolutely unparalleled for these people. And it's not just, as I started to mention, their camaraderie. It's their partnership in the gospel. It's their partnership in suffering. It's their partnership in grace. The proclamation and the advance and the defense of the gospel. This is why we love each other as we do. And because of that, our love for each other compels us to be concerned with our needs, all of them, but more, most specifically and most importantly, the needs of our spiritual growth. That we mature in Christ, that we're growing in our knowledge of the faith, that we may teach others to do the same. And Paul's hard-pressed. But he's not overwhelmed by the pain of suffering. It's going to sound so cliche when I say this. Paul is not overwhelmed by the pain of suffering. He is overwhelmed by the gain of it all. <laughs> this is like... I don't know what it's like. You used to say it's like Christmas, but Christmas isn't all that cool anymore. He's just been given everything. Every choice he could possibly ever desire is there. And Paul's like, I'm overwhelmed by the gain of both. <laughs> I do this, and it's like, yes, awesome, hallelujah, I can't wait, I want it, I want it. This, oh my goodness, what am I going to do here? This is why I do this. This over here is the one day they'll get this. <gasps> That's why I do this, so that they'll get this. So that they'll desire Christ. So that their death will be gain for them. I'm going to stay. I'm going to stay. Oh God, I'm going to stay. Because you know what would be worse? You know what would be greater than just being with Christ? Is their being with me in this joy with Christ. There is the issue that's going on in Paul's mind. And this is the issue that as someone who has had his life instructed to teach others to see this type of thing, this is my heart for you. That you see this as not an option, but a guarantee. Not a, I wish it would happen, but a certain hope. Why do we preach? So that you can have that kind of dichotomy. So that you and I would have that type of intimacy. Why? Because that's what Christ does. 
And if it's not there, Christ isn't in us. And if it's weak, it's because God's Word is not in us. And we're not praying the way we should. But if Christ is in us, we will. And we'll be spurred on through the Gospel, through the words of Christ, through the Scriptures. We'll be spurred on and carried by the power of the Holy Spirit that even in our weakness, He will prompt us to pray. And he will pray. I will gain, Paul says. <laughs> Either way, I win. But if I stay a little longer, I win greatly. What does he win? It's not a game. No, it's a prize. It's a prize. And it is a plurality of prizes. As Christ redeems His people, friends, there is no greater joy in this world than seeing a lost, dead, blind person be given life through the gospel. It's no greater joy. Recently, there have been historical anniversaries of the Holocaust in Nazi Germany. And I've read a lot of things. We've shown a lot of videos, even to our children. And you see a lot of people who, who journaled through that time. And a lot of people, even Nazi family members, who did all they could to save people from concentration camps, from death camps. Let's call them what they are. Death camps. And yet, all the ones they saved, as wonderful as it was, was never satisfying enough for them as they wrote and as they pled and as they shared their stories years later if they could have just saved another one just one more if they could have just seen one more family not torn apart by this wickedness and that's earthly and temporal and people give their lives and that is very honorable and very godly to sanctify to, 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 to sanctify life and to preserve it. But it is not ultimate. And in, in a compounding way, our heart for lost people should be a million times over. We don't have to see people starving in chains to think they're dead. Because all we need to do is just look around our streets. Paul, not only does he gain with both choices, he lives with both choices. He lives either way. If I live, I live. If I die, I live. So, why die if I'm going to live? Anyway, I might as well live as long as I can here so that others may live with me. So that the church may grow. I rejoice. The more I see come to grow and mature and rejoice in Christ, the more I grow in my love for you and in my love for Christ, and I rejoice. Because one day I will get that prize for which I'm fighting. I don't have to rush it. I have a desire to depart, Paul would say. And be with Christ, for that is far better. Paul would rather die, if given the true choice of his heart, he would rather die so that he might see Christ, and that he might see Christ glorified in his death. Because at the last moment, Paul says, I want Christ to be honored in my body, whether by life or death. Whether in life or death. So if I die, Christ is honored in my body. If I live, Christ is honored in my body. That's what he argues there with that text just a few verses before. If I live, we've talked about what that looks like. If I die, then Christ is glorified in my death. Why? Because I did not give up the faith. Because they gave me what I longed for. Because Christ is sovereign over my life and when He chooses for it to be taken from me, it will be a catalyst of fire to spread the gospel like there's no tomorrow. And these people have no idea what's going to happen when they take my head from my body. I win, Christ wins, the kingdom of heaven wins, and the gospel explodes, and they may even win because God may save them. See, these are the things 
that are going through Paul's mind based on that which he's written here. He wanted to see Christ's gospel explode and expand. He wanted to see in his death Christ's work in him. That he would boldly stand and go, You, O oh Caesar, are not sovereign. Can you believe what that man said to him? He told the Caesar he wasn't sovereign. They took his head off. Look at the church. The world would look at Paul's death and the church and they would say, What a fool. And the church would look at Paul's death and go, Hallelujah. He got it. He received his great reward. Isn't that it? Not just for himself, but for the saints. His martyrdom would embolden and vindicate his chain his claims. His chains will be broken forever. You know, you're making some bold steps here. Well, just think about how Saul began his ministry. How did Saul begin his ministry in persecuting the church? Through a humble, quiet, bold servant named Stephen. Full of the Holy Spirit. And Stephen began to preach the gospel and serve people for the sake of Christ. And Stephen was lied against and wrongly accused and wrongly convicted of blasphemy. And Saul, as part of the Sanhedrin, stood in agreement with his killing. And the death of Stephen did not silence the church. As a matter of fact, the church was going pretty well in Jerusalem. Everything was going pretty good. It was tense because there were some political issues happening. And the Pharisees and Rome and you name it. But it was contained. It was contained in Jerusalem. And when Stephen died, it just broke loose. The apostles fled. The apostles left and began to not hide, though they did take concern for their safety. They went to city, to city, to city, to city. Oh my gosh, they're killing us for preaching this. We better get the message out before we die. And it is the death of Stephen that God used to bring the gospel to me and to you. It is the death of Stephen that empowered this zealous Pharisee named Saul to begin to persecute the church. And at the right time, at the right time, as he was about to meet up with the disciples and have them arrested, Christ said, enough's enough. Now you're mine. In chapter 8 of Acts, and I might have mentioned this last week, but in chapter 8 of Acts, there were unnamed individuals with loud lamenting who uncovered the body of Stephen and carried him through the streets of Jerusalem to give him a proper burial. Death sentence. If you've just seen one of your brothers die for proclaiming the gospel and wrongly accused and killed because of false accusations and lies of blasphemy and they stoned him, what do you think would happen to you if, if you broke the law and touched a dead body, much less a condemned body, in opposition to the Pharisees' rule? You would have been stoned. You know, I don't think their names are listed. They didn't live long enough to get them. I really do. Wailing loudly, carrying the body of Stephen through the streets of Jerusalem, giving him a proper burial. That's not scared people. That's empowered people. That's what gaining, even in the death of Paul, would, would do for the church. And eventually it would. I want to die. And then y'all would know that I'm with Christ. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. As I've already said, that you may grow to have a love and affection for Christ and maturity in Christ. 
It's more vital that I stay. So because of you, I want to stay over death. Because of you, I remain. For you are the body of that which I love greatly. You are the body of my Lord, of which I am a part. So therefore, I stay that you may be stronger. I stay that you may be unified. When he says, I am convinced of this, it doesn't mean that there was all of a sudden this epiphany that just happened, that God had talked to him through a, a, a vision. No, I have come to conclude and now I'm convinced. Here's my argument. I don't know what to do. I'm hard-pressed to live as Christ or die is even better. My desire is to be with Christ but that's because that's far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary. It's more important right now on your behalf. So I'm convinced of this, that I know I will remain. How did he know that? How did Paul know he had come to the conclusion so he was convinced that it was better that he stay? So how did he know that he would not die? Because he prayed and God gave him the wisdom to know that the prayers that he should pray would be for his release, for his continuation. So the Spirit of God gave him peace with that prayer. Not to pray that which would also have been good. God, when I speak before Caesar, I'm looking forward to my head being removed. I mean, think about it for a minute. I am convinced that I will remain and continue with all of you for the sake of your progress in the faith and your joy in the faith. I will remain gaining what I desire either way. I will continue with you because my affection is great for you as it is the affection that is in Christ Jesus so that you will grow, so that you will glory. Have joy. I will glory in my Redeemer. I will glory. The, the root of glorying in Christ is having joy in Christ. And how does that come? Well... Think about it for a minute. Paul proclaims to the Philippians. He prays with the Philippians. He partners with the Philippians. He sees God produce the fruit of righteousness in the Philippians. He perseveres with the Philippians. That's how they'll grow. That's how they'll grow. He'll continue to see them. He'll continue to pray for them. He'll continue to write to them. He'll continue to grow others who will continue the ministry that He was doing. And the church will grow. The church will grow. Friends, I'm going to tell you, some of the greatest spiritual growth in my life has been through the death of saints. But the death of those saints, though glorious, had that kind of impact because of the life they lived with me before they died. And I think Paul knew that. There would be a day where he would be with the Lord. That was a guarantee. And there will be a day when you and I will be with the Lord. But until that day, our whole duty is to grow for the sake of each other. For the sake of growing each other in that joy. I will continue with you. Growing in the faith then, according to Paul's argument, growing produces glory. Growing produces joy. Those are together. They cannot be separated. That I, For your progress in joy, as you progress, joy is the evidence. Is that not the whole point of Philippians chapter 1? Look at the junk I'm in. Look at the problems I'm in. Look at the position I'm in. Wow! Hallelujah! I praise God through it all. It's all for good. This is the point of my suffering. Now I'm going to stay here and suffer well that you can learn, as we'll see in a minute, to suffer well. 
Well, not in a minute, in a few weeks. Because Paul is very clear that these Philippian Christians are going to suffer exactly like he's suffering. Grow it in the faith by learning in the faith, by discerning in the faith, by seeing the glory of Christ in the midst of suffering. And those who are redeemed in the faith will bring joy in the faith. We together will have joy. I've always thought this for at least a decade or more, and I teach this to younger men in the ministry. I said, I say this, that the one test that should surpass all as to the fruitfulness, as to the condition of your ministry is the joy of your people in Christ. Individually and as a whole. When someone's joy is gone, they are not walking with Christ. They are running, defending their own positions. They're in despair. And our responsibility is to, is to see that joy return. Because who could answer Paul's problems? Nobody. There's only one man in the breathing earth that could release Paul from prison. And that was Caesar. That's it. Nobody could do anything. And Paul said, hey, this is in the hands of Christ. And Christ will do what needs to be done. You are going to grow. And then we, as we grow, will grow others. What do we do as we grow? Well, let's just think about some of the things Paul says. We contend, we proclaim, we pray, we partner with the gospel. But it's all about togetherness, isn't it? It's all about being the body together. I want you to think about this for a minute. I want you to think about those who so often profess Christ. Oh yeah, I'm a, I'm a brother, I'm a sister, I'm in the church, I'm here. And these individuals can give right theology. They're, they're solid. Oh yeah, this is what the Bible teaches. But there's no fruit of that doctrine. There's no fruit of that theology. Because when life gets hard, they quit. When it gets difficult, they run. When there's conflict, they hide. Or worse, they turn a selfish eye. They, they run from their own sin. They run from discord. They don't have forgiveness. They don't pursue unity. They don't pray. Therefore, they don't live in obedience. Friends, we can obey everything that we find in the entire Bible. Everything we find in the entire Bible. And yet, we ignore one thing. We've broken them all. And Jesus does not lightly answer the questions of the Jews when they try to confront Him and say, what is the greatest of all the laws of the prophets? He says, the greatest of all the laws is this, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and your mind and your strength. The second of equal standing to love your neighbor as yourself. All the laws of the prophets hinge on these. John echoes that sentiment. Paul, of course, teaches to that in all of his epistles. John says it in his first epistle when he says that if we walk in dark, I walk in, we, set, we confess the light, but yet we don't love our brother, we lie. And we do not practice the truth. And yet, and therefore, we walk in darkness. Friends, these individuals who have the right doctrine but who do not love the body are not of the body. And so at the base of it all, we got to grow to learn what's required of us. Paul says to the Corinthian church, I'm just going to, I'm just going to exaggerate for a minute and paraphrase. If I love and help orphans, and I worship, and I give, and I do all good things for all people, but I have no love, I'm worthless. Friends, love hurts. It costs. It bruises. Sometimes it batters. 
What is the love of Christ that he gave himself up for us that while we were still enemies, Christ died for us? There's no greater love than this, Jesus would say, than a man lay down his life for a brother. When none of us can die to save anybody from sin. But we can die to ourselves for the sake of growing each other in the faith. And that, that changes. It's hard some seasons, and some seasons you're like, well, this is pretty easy. And then it's like, brick wall. Sometimes it's a slide. Sometimes it's a swing. Sometimes it's a shipwreck. The point is, are we growing with that in mind? Are we growing to be a people? If we are in the faith, then our heart will be tuned to live our lives out with the saints of God. Our heart will be molded as a disciple of Christ. That's why church discipline is one of these central anti-cultural practices of the church. Well, that's just a... Well, see, church discipline isn't... It, isn't it, it doesn't even start here. You can't worship with us anymore. Don't come back to our place. Church discipline, according to the way Jesus teaches it and Paul teaches it, is you can't come back to our people. Does that make sense? Why? Because Paul will argue in just a few verses... He will argue I'll leave that guy. But Paul will argue this that what God has done through the gospel of Jesus Christ is evident only in the unity of His people. And that if we are not focused on that as we grow, as He tells the Corinthian church, all spiritual gifts are for the what unification and the edification of the whole. Then we're not seeing the reality of the gospel. We're not seeing the fullness of the gospel. And as he closes, he says, I want you to see this. I want you to grow. I want you to grow together. I want you to grow powerfully strong. I want you to maintain your prayer life. I want you to... And who do we pray for? Each other. I want you to maintain your ministry. Who do we minister to? Each other. I want you to maintain the gospel proclamation. Who, do we, who, who preaches the gospel? The church. To whom? To the world, to the lost, and to each other. What was empowering Paul to stand under this suffering? The gospel. So that in me, you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus. And I'm going to spend some time on that next week. But in a nutshell, think about this. Paul, as much as he would glory in Christ by himself in that cell with no contact with the outside world, thought it fruitless, thought it worthless. So that you Philippians in me may have ample cause, as I am here as an example to you, with you, as a partner with you, you then have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus. So as I grow and as I share and as I live and to live as Christ, to die is better, and I suffer and these things happen to me, you will glory in Christ Jesus. Your joy will be complete. Your joy will be full. That's what John calls it. We write these things that our joy may be complete. We glory in Christ. See, I don't believe individuals glory in Christ alone. We should, we do, but what to what end? That we as a people glory. 
not me and my family, though we should and will by the grace of God, or my town or community, but God's church to display the manifold wisdom of God to the powers and principalities of the heavenly places. So, where is your joy? Where is your joy found in the world? Where is your ministry? Where is your hope? And I believe we can ask the question, where is your power? I believe it's in Christ. Paul says it is in Christ. All these things are in Christ for the sake of the elect of God, for their growth and for their joy and for their hope in Christ alone. Let's pray. Father, we are just this life. What is it that we could say? We are often downtrodden. We are often in despair. We are often feeling hopeless. But Lord, in Your great power, You encourage us. You grow us. You redeemed us. You are saving us and holding us and securing us. And God, if nothing else from this day, could we be encouraged? Would You plan in us a season of encouragement through the life of Paul? That we would just, in the midst of suffering, rejoice. Even when we know no words, we could have joy. Father, that You'd power, empower us to pray for one another. And more than just our physical needs, that we, that we would pray for each other's spiritual joy. That we would pray for each other's growth in Christ. Father, that we would look upon each other's lives and we would see with great discernment and spiritual lenses, we would see how we could be a blessing to each other. Father, help us to grow. Help us to grow that as we live and move in this world, we would not be myopic and self-centered, but Father, open and giving a blessing to each other. And Father, let us also not forsake the going of the gospel, that we would at every turn be able to, and empowered to share the gospel of Christ. And Father, we pray these things in the name of Jesus.